In 1949, the Swiss-German psychiatrist and philosopher Carl Jaspers introduced the idea of the Axial Age in his work The Origin and Goal of History. Jaspers had come to see that, beginning in roughly the 8th century BC, a number of monumental transformations began to radically transform human consciousness. Jaspers argued that during this period spanning the 8th to 3rd centuries BC, quote, the spiritual foundations of humanity were laid simultaneously and independently in China, India, Persia, Judea, and Greece. And these are the foundations upon which humanity still subsists today, end quote. During this period, the philosophers Confucius and Lao Tzu developed the foundations of Confucianism and Taoism in China. The mystic Zoroaster came to create one of the world's first monotheistic religions, Zoroastrianism, in the Achaemenid Empire. In the Levant, this was the time of the Hebrew prophets, figures such as Isaiah and Elijah. In India, Siddhartha Gautama came to found the religious and philosophical tradition of Buddhism, and the Upanishads were developed within the Hindu oral poetic tradition. In Greece, Plato synthesized the Hellenic philosophical tradition into a cohesive corpus of ethics, epistemology, cosmology, and metaphysics. Interestingly, this axial age also saw a triple conjunction of the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Ancient astrologers would have been unable to actually observe this event, as the outer planets had not yet been discovered. But with modern technologies, we can now see that this triple conjunction of the outer planets was an event which has only occurred once in recorded human history, and it occurred in 577 BC, very closely according with the crest of the axial period. The Axial Age was a period in which titanic forces were at work in giving shape to human consciousness, and the scope of these transformations is such that we may still yet be unable to fully grasp their magnitude and the true depth of their implications. As Carl Jaspers himself saw it, the Axial Age was a period in which the phenomenological structure of the human spirit came to be deeply reconstituted through a shift upwards towards the domain of universality. The sense of what it was to be human was drastically transmuted. The sense of what exactly the pronoun I refers to came to be experienced very differently than had been the case over the previous thousands of years of human history. Prior to the Axial Age, the human sense of spirituality and existential constitution was much more heavily associated with ties of kinship, nationality, blood, and soil. Human beings oriented themselves to their life worlds through orienting themselves towards gods which were largely parochial in character. The ancient Athenians revered Athena, the goddess of Athens. The ancient Babylonians revered Marduk, who was considered to be the patron deity of the Babylonian people. The sky father deity Yahweh was considered the god of Israel, in contrast to deities such as Baal, the patron deity of the Canaanites. Within such life worlds, there was no sense to be made of abstracting an individual human being from the currents of genealogy, tribal, and national history within which that individual was inextricably interwoven. A human being was a part of a larger social fabric, or he was simply nothing at all. The gods of this world would punish entire cities or civilizations for the crimes of the few, something which we see repeatedly throughout the Hebrew Bible and exemplified in the fates of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
within such stories, gods are seen to regard human beings in the same way that human beings saw themselves, as peoples first, and as individuals second, if at all. Yet, with the Axial Age, we see this framing come to shift. As human spirituality came to orient itself away from the particularities of kinship and towards the universal, towards the realm of form, towards the cosmos as a totality, towards the formless absolution of pure consciousness. Deities such as the Hindu Brahman and Zoroastrian Ahura Mazda came to be conceptualized not as the patron deities of particular peoples, but rather as truly cosmic beings, which related to human beings as such, independently of ethnic or national identities. Within this expanding orientation towards the universal, we see then an equal and opposite contraction of the human sense of selfhood. For the first time, it was now possible for the human soul to be conceptualized as something which existed in relation to a universal absolute, independently of its relation to currents of national and ethnic identity. It was now possible to be an individual first, and secondarily part of a larger social fabric. We see the conflict generated by this transmutation of consciousness exemplified within Plato's Apology of Socrates, in which the philosopher Socrates is brought to trial and ultimately condemned to death on accusations of eroding the cultural assumptions which underpinned Athenian society. Socrates claimed to know nothing, but this humble admission carried with it the implication that no one really knew anything, and moreover, that achieving truth demanded that human beings explore the realm of ideas through the use of their own intellect. Through dialogue, the truth would come to unveil itself, and the falsehoods and contradictions within our presuppositions about the world would likewise come to be revealed. What Socrates had developed was a conception of the human being as an intellectual agent which was capable of navigating the realm of ideas of its own volition and thereby establishing a relationship to truth which was independent of the cultural norms, dogmas, and doctrines of the society which the individual was embedded within. Those who held power within the Athenian polity, and who therefore had much to lose from a breakdown of social order, saw the philosophy of Socrates as immensely dangerous to their form of life, as it brought with it the possibility that individual human beings, or collectives of such individuals might come to subvert or overturn the pillars of the prevailing order. Over the course of the Axial Age and beyond, the culture forms of the Eurasian world would come to contend with the contradictions which emerged from this development in different ways. The Eastern world would come to conceptualize the individual ego as a problem to be solved. In contrast, more Western cultures rarely sought to annihilate the individual in this manner. Through such narratives as the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Homeric epics of the Iliad and the Odyssey, we see that the West developed instead a tradition of romanticizing the individual human will, the solar principle. Within the myth of Prometheus, the titular deity defies the Olympian gods by bestowing upon humanity the fires of the transcendental realm, a power which allows humanity to develop knowledge, technology, and civilization. The fires brought down to mankind by Prometheus are of a kind with the fires of the sun which bestow light on the world. They are the fires of the will, as indicated by the etymology of the name Prometheus itself, which is believed to be derived from a word translated as forethought or planning, or which we might also understand as meaning purposiveness.
the processes of consciousness which precede active agency. Through this cultural romanticism of the individual, the Western world would cultivate the conditions for the flowering of heroic individuality and consequently create the conditions through which the individual will to power would come to dominance, a process which would ultimately culminate in the titanic metastasizing of the Roman Empire. An absolutely central and world-generating contradiction would come to churn within the soul of the Western world, between the will to live within and through the world, and the will to conquer, subjugate, and master the world. The ancestors of those who settled in the westernmost reaches of Eurasia were tribes which, for various reasons, came to follow the trajectory of the sun as it traveled west towards the distant horizon. The following of the sun westward is, I believe, an archetypal image which lies at the very core of the western collective unconscious. It was an experience which was shared by innumerable individuals over the course of history as various peoples came to migrate unto new lands or set out to conquer them. Every step of the way, when the ancestors of Western peoples found themselves following the sun westward, their consciousness synchronized and resonated with near-identical experiences of those which came before them in a process which spanned tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. The image of the setting sun contains within it the destiny of the Western soul. One of the most obvious examples of this archetypal constellation coming to emerge can be found in the manifest destiny which compelled the peoples of the early United States to set about westward unto the conquest of the North American continent. Now there are certainly more seemingly mundane social and political factors which drove this westward expansion of the United States, but I believe that underlying those more superficial factors was ultimately a compulsion to reenact the western hero's journey. The will to strike out into the unknown, lay claim to uncharted lands, and discover buried secrets is a force which was developed to its most extreme acuity within the Western spirit, and we see this process reenacted repeatedly throughout the history of Western civilization. Japan, conversely, is known as the Land of the Rising Sun. While the souls of Western peoples were drawn westward towards the ultimate goal or destiny of the solar archetype, the Far Eastern spirit seems to have been drawn backwards towards the origin of the solar archetype, towards the darkness and formless stillness of Satori consciousness, which we see exemplified in Japanese Zen Buddhism. Buddhist iconography almost universally depicts the Buddha with his eyes closed, thereby attuning consciousness towards the darkness of pure awareness, the darkness from which the sun emerges as it rises from the eastern horizon of the Pacific Ocean. In contrast, the iconography of Christianity tends to depict Christ with his eyes not only open, but turned upward, towards the light which descends from the transcendental realm. There is much more to be said of the role which Christianity plays in this narrative, and that is a topic which we will be returning to in much more detail later on. Now some of you might already be wondering if this archetypal complex applies only to European cultures. And history seems to indicate that we actually do see something similar in the cultures of West Africa as well. In a somewhat legendary account relayed by the Emperor of Mali, Mansa Musa, it was said that Musa's predecessor, possibly the Malian king Mansa Muhammad ibn Q, had become obsessed with discovering what lay beyond the horizon of the Atlantic Ocean. 
Mansa Musa claimed that his predecessor had set out on a voyage across the Atlantic and had never returned. It is speculated that this voyage occurred around the year 1312, 180 years prior to the voyage of Christopher Columbus. Despite there being such extensive cultural and racial differences, it may very well be the case that the ultimate destinies of Europe and Africa are in fact deeply intertwined. The history of music might be a window into the interactions of these underlying currents of consciousness. Although musical traditions throughout the world are immensely variable, there are nonetheless many significant and near-universal commonalities. Most musical traditions throughout the world are modal in compositional structure. This means that a single tonic note serves as a kind of foundation for a piece of music. One note of a given scale is played as a background drone or pedal point, or is repeatedly returned to in the lower register of the melodies. The sense of tension or rest is thus felt to be determined in relation to this individual note. It serves as a ground or foundation for the piece of music. The music you are hearing now is a modal piece. You will notice that there is a constant sense of emotional aura which permeates the composition. Within the world of Christendom, however, we see the development of what is appropriately called solar harmony. Rather than resting upon a single tonic note, solar music establishes a particular chord as its center of tonal gravity. A chord progression is a polyphonic dance of melodies which spiral inward and outward in relation to that tonal centerpiece. This can be thought of as introducing an additional dimension to the compositional structure. Rather than building a composition upon a single tonic note, the music is able to flow in and out of different modal domains, or chords. The harmonic form of the composition, then, is not determined by an ever-present tonic note, but rather is determined by the implied destination of the chord sequence. The music is not defined by the ground which it stands upon, but rather by where it indicates that it is going. The piece that is now playing is such a solar chord progression. Moreover, it is a chord progression that implies a certain destination or tonic chord, but never actually arrives there. It circles the implied tonic in much the same way that the planets are, in a sense, constantly falling towards the sun, but always missing it. Western solar harmony, therefore, is a perfect formal exemplification of the dynamics which are at work within the Western psyche. The individual soul is defined in terms of logos, telos, destiny and will, rather than by the fundamental underlying constancy of concepts such as Brahman, Wuji, or Satori.
in the United States, blues and jazz music would come to emerge as a synthesis of the solar harmony developed by Christendom and the improvisational character of the West African musical tradition. Jazz music in particular would develop the most intricate and sometimes extreme implications of this synthesis. By utilizing the possibilities of tonal ambiguity, jazz composers were able to create a form of harmony in which the implied tonal destination of the harmony is itself in a constant state of flux. A jazz composer will often use a chord which is expected to function in a particular way in relation to a particular tonic chord, but then as the chord progression unfolds, we see that the chord was actually doing something completely different in relation to one or more implied tonal destinations. Every safe landing reveals itself to actually be a springboard into a completely new realm of harmonic structure. Through this synthesis, the individual will of the musician becomes almost fully liberated. When a jazz pianist sits down and plays his first chord, he might have absolutely no idea where the journey ahead will take him, no idea what the final resolution to the narrative will be, and no idea as to what sorts of melodies his fellow musicians will bring into juxtaposition with his own decisions. Jazz is the ideal of finding harmonious order within vast landscapes of freedom. It is the spiritual expression in pure patternicity of the deepest impulses within the American spirit. But before we dive any further into analyzing the present or recent past, we need to back up a bit and look towards an event which can be understood as the great climax of the processes which were set in motion within the Axial Age. Here we must turn our attention to the story of Christ and the inner currents of consciousness which converged within Christ's death and resurrection, and the currents which flowed out from the metaphysical implications of those events. The figure of Christ is generally considered to be the human incarnation of the cosmic logos, the will of God which generates and sustains the world. This incarnation can then be understood as the culmination of the axial transformations which had shaped the Western world over the course of the previous 800 years. The incarnation is understood to be the making available of the possibility of human theosis. Through embodying the spirit of Christ, Christians aspire to achieve transcendence through the aligning of their own will, their own solar principle, with the will of God, the divine logos or cosmic solar principle. Through such theosis, the divine lunar principle, or Holy Spirit, is then able to manifest within communities of Christ's followers, so as to create a life world which is woven together by the divine logos, rather than by the structures of violence and financial power which animated the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire exemplified the opposing possibility which was available to such a solar civilization. Roman emperors were typically generals who were able to command violence and power on a scale which the world had never before seen up to that point in history. The lifeblood of Rome consisted in gold, slaves, and blood. This teleological constitution of Rome is exemplified by the ritual known as the Roman Triumph. Following a military victory, a Roman general would march in a parade through the streets of Rome accompanied by prisoners of war bound by chains. This parade would come to an end at the Temple of Jupiter the god of expansive growth and vital powers. 
and the prisoners brought forth would be ritually executed as sacrifices to the Sky Father of lightning and strength. Such a ritual is an indication of a collective teleology, the ideal which animates a people, the ultimate animating ideal which gave shape and identity to Rome was Jovian power. The power which held together Rome herself was thus the power of individual Roman leaders to conquer and maintain the subjugation of the vanquished. Yet this ideal within which the Jovian archetype served as the center of teleological gravity was not one which was available to all. The Roman ideal was one which was to be aspired towards by generals and statesmen, not slaves or plebeians. The Roman ideal of the ultimate good was available only to a certain elect, and as such, the Roman life world was deeply unstable down to its very core. Christianity then brought with it a new structure of values, which set itself in diametric opposition to that embodied by Rome. Christianity was a prophecy of a kingdom of Christ, which would be shaped and sustained not by Jovian power, but rather by the solar will to theosis, an ideal which could be exemplified by anyone and which in fact was said to be more readily available to those who were powerless than to those who wielded immense strength and wealth. Christianity would come to utterly reshape the Western world, but over the course of the first centuries after the life of Christ, however, many events would transpire which would make the Christian world into a powder keg, which was destined to recreate the Roman spirit in ways that no Roman emperor could have ever possibly even dreamed of. What Christianity demanded was extremely radical the dissolution of the structures of violence power, which had held together the Roman world and the creation of cohesive communities which were joined with one another by mutualistic devotion. It is certainly true that many Christians did do exactly that and created communities which largely embodied the Christian imperative. Nevertheless, the final answer to the contradictions of love and power was an uneasy compromise. The Western Roman Empire did not give way to a kingdom of God, but rather became the Holy Roman Empire, while the Eastern Roman Empire likewise became ostensibly Christianized while still undeniably animated by the imperial spirit of Rome. In order to prevent Christianity from utterly annihilating their civilization, the Romans did the only thing that they could. They Romanized Christianity, transforming the movement into an institutionalized hierarchical structure with definitive creeds, doctrines, procedures, and laws. The Roman bureaucracy changed clothes and declared that they were now the representatives of God's will. In fact, Christianity proved quite useful to the power systems which survived and succeeded the fall of the Roman Empire. Christianity was a universalistic religion which could be used to eradicate the more local, pre-axial spiritual traditions of the Germanic, Balkan, and Slavic peoples who maintained a sense of separate spiritual identity from the empires which had subjugated them. Charlemagne, for example, not only used Christianity as a justification for waging war upon the Germanic peoples, but also used Christian conversion to destroy the sense of Germanic identity which he saw correctly as a threat to his power. The ghosts of these events would reemerge many centuries later with unimaginably violent consequences for Europe. 
Christianity was used as a bludgeon with which to beat down into the soil the more lunar forms of nature spirituality and nationalistic spirituality throughout Europe. Institutional forms of Christianity thus came to define themselves in contrast to these pagan beliefs. These parochial traditions emphasize the spirituality of nature and the human body. In order to demonize such forms of spirituality, Christianity came to emphasize the transcendent, condemning the body often as fundamentally impure and sinful, and overall characterizing the natural world as an imperfect, fleeting imitation of a heavenly realm which lay not within the natural world, but inextricably beyond it. It was this disavowal of the natural world and bifurcating of the divine from the natural world, which would ultimately lay the groundwork for the post-Cartesian materialistic conception of nature which then opened up the very possibility of modern secularism. Furthermore, the core essence of the Christian understanding of theosis stood in conflict with the fundamentally absolutist and doctrinal character of bureaucratic, institutionalized Christianity. The very idea of realizing the spirit of Christ within the heart of an individual human being would seem to necessitate that individuals voluntarily decide to align themselves with the spirit of Christ. Christianity seems to require that Christians freely choose to devote themselves to manifesting God's love within the world, and yet institutional Christianity came to operate in such a manner that simply going through the ritualistic motions was all that was ever really demanded of most individuals. We in the modern world might think there is something awfully paradoxical looking back to events such as the Spanish conquest of the Americas. The Spaniards were ostensibly Christians, and we then wonder how such individuals could have possibly justified to themselves or one another practices such as systematic torture, rape, and enslavement. But if we take into account the fundamentally doctrinal character of post-Roman Christianity, this begins to seem much less strange. The Spanish conquistadors believed that they were Christians because they did the things which they were told to do in order to be Christians. Nonetheless, Christianity as a philosophy is a very complex body of dense symbolic structures with implications which necessitate an understanding of Platonic and Neoplatonic metaphysics. The Spanish conquistadors would have unthinkingly and unquestioningly agreed that Christ died for their sins, but due to that very unthinking and unquestioning, it is likely that none of them had even the slightest understanding of what the implications of that statement were actually supposed to be. Due to the doctrinal and institutional nature of post-Roman Christianity, it was only an elect of educated priests and monks who were actually capable of understanding the philosophical implications of Christianity. As such, it is actually quite unsurprising that the Spanish conquerors and Spanish crown saw no issue with the subjugation and plunder of the New World while it was Bartolomé de las Casas, a Dominican priest, who saw the actions of the Spanish in the New World as theologically unacceptable. Many of the Christians within this world saw their faith simply as compliance with the norms and prevailing structures of power which they found themselves within. As such, Christianity had become, for many, simply a tradition of essentially empty gestures which held no real moral power over those who performed them. 
through these developments, we can identify three fundamental contradictions which would come to fester within the heart of the medieval Christian world. The seemingly irresolvable contrasts of power and love, transcendence and imminence, dogma and doubt. Each of these three dualities would come to explode in their own ways, and these explosions of dialectical friction would serve as the engines of what would ultimately be called modernity. Within his Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel developed an idea which has commonly become known as the master-slave dialectic. Hegel presents this idea as a kind of mythic story about two individuals. When the individuals meet one another, they have never seen any other human beings before. They are shocked by the encounter as they not only recognize one another, but also recognize the other's recognition of themselves. The subjectivities of the two individuals thus serve as a kind of infinity mirror, an endless recursion of reflections. Prior to this encounter, the individual subjects lacked what we might call a higher-order sense of selfhood. They simply existed in the world, but now, due to the presence of the other, the subjects now find themselves seeing themselves through how they are seen by the other person. The subjectivity of the individual has come to be defined in contrast to the other, through which he is now forced to see himself. The individuals are infuriated by this, by the thought that they might be seen as inferior to the other, or that the other's gaze might somehow make them see themselves as less than they believe themselves to be. And as such, the two engage in a battle for dominance. One will ultimately prevail, becoming the master, and the other will be forced to become the slave. But the story doesn't end with that. In fact, here we have only the beginning. For now that the master holds power over the slave, the master's entire sense of identity comes to be defined by his contrast with the slave. The master doesn't need to work or self-reflect. He needn't be cunning or resourceful. The slave, on the other hand, comes to develop ways of seeing himself independently of his relation to the master. The slave lacks the blunt power of the master, and so the slave becomes clever, frugal, efficient, and moreover, vengeful, awaiting the day that he will have bided his time long enough and can usurp the role of master for himself. We can now see the bigger picture here, that this is a vicious and potentially endless cycle which will continue to reiterate itself. So what exactly was Hegel trying to illustrate here? It is certainly the case that the master-slave dialectic can be seen in actual relationships of power between human beings, and we can identify this pattern unfolding throughout the course of history. But if we stop there, then we miss the full force of what Hegel is trying to convey. The master-slave dialectic is not simply about human beings subjugating one another. It is about dialectics, about the way in which dualities come to be interdependent upon one another, and how those relations of interdependence come to invert themselves due to imbalances of dominance. So let us then recall once more the dualities which crystallized within post-Roman Christianity. Transcendence and imminence, dogma and doubt, power and love. In each of these dualities we have one pole which is regarded as absolutely dominant over the other within institutional Christianity. Yet simultaneously the dominant pole comes to be defined in contrast to the subordinate pole. 
metaphysically the ultimacy and perfection of the transcendent realm, for example, is defined in contrast with the impure, sinful, and disposable nature of the imminent bodily realm. Yet this imbalance then results in a convoluted maelstrom which begins to invert and contort itself due to its internal contradictions. If the transcendent is utterly beyond the realm of becoming, within which human beings actually live our lives, then the ideals of the transcendental world begin to seem unrealizable and thus irrelevant. Why reach for ideals which cannot be reached? Why live at all if denial of the bodily world is our means of achieving salvation? How can a perfect transcendental realm give rise to an imperfect natural world unless the transcendental realm was itself imperfect? Now, to be clear here, I am not saying that this duality of transcendence and imminence is completely irreconcilable, nor am I saying that this imbalance of transcendent and imminent is necessarily implied by the canonical Christian Gospels. What I am saying is that through the subordination of the imminent by the transcendent, a dialectical inversion was set in motion. Although there are innumerable historical events and philosophical thinkers which could be pointed to as enacting these dialectical inversions within Western consciousness, one thinker in particular seems to exemplify the crescendo of such transformation more so than any other. That thinker, I believe, is Friedrich Nietzsche. Within Nietzsche's thought, we see a complete inversion of each of the fundamental dualities which came to characterize the metaphysical structure of Christendom. Nietzsche regarded the bodily, imminent realm as ontologically prior to the transcendental realm of forms, ideas, angels, and souls. Christendom had come to regard human beings as souls which possessed bodies. Nietzsche came to see human beings as bodies which possessed souls. Likewise, Nietzsche rejected any and all forms of dogmatism and viciously criticized the very notions of absolute or purely objective truth. Nietzsche was a nomadic thinker a wanderer driven by an unrelenting pursuit of freedom from the world which had created him. Through its own opposition to paganism and its compromise with the Roman social order, Christianity had come to create ruptures between the polarities which lay at the heart of the Platonic metaphysical paradigm which underpinned Christianity. As the transcendental realm came to be regarded as something which lay an infinite distance beyond the natural world through its supremacy over the natural world, the transcendent ironically came to disintegrate. And this disintegration is exactly what we see expressed in the philosophy of Nietzsche. Nietzsche saw the transcendental as merely a projection of the bodily realm, which Nietzsche saw as characterized fundamentally by what he called the will to power. Ideas and truths, therefore, along with gods and values, were seen by Nietzsche as creations of the will to power. Nietzsche saw these transcendental objects as constructions of the human will to power, as ways in which the will to power came to establish and solidify its dominance over the world and over other human beings. Beneath our ostensive concerns for objectivity and truth, Nietzsche saw only the will to mastery. As such, Nietzsche fully rejected the Christian and Platonic notions of transcendence, as Nietzsche saw human existence as being most essentially embodied will to power, Nietzsche came to see Platonic and Christian metaphysics as being a kind of malignant contortion of such will to power, a will to dominate which had come to be turned back upon itself 
thus resulting in philosophies of life denial, which rejected the inextricably embodied and power-hungry essence of actual human existence. As Nietzsche saw Christianity, Stoicism, and Platonism as modes of life denial, what Nietzsche sought was instead life affirmation, the capacity to say yes to life rather than attempt to escape from life into some imagined transcendental world to accept and affirm the will to power which animated the human psyche and the human body, and to live in accordance with values which aligned with such will to power. Yet it is here that we find then the ultimate fate of Nietzsche's philosophy and of the man Nietzsche himself. It wasn't enough for Nietzsche to simply reject Platonism and Christianity in favor of a neo-Roman or a Bronze Age warrior ethic. The Romans did not see Jupiter as a manifestation of human will to power. They believed in a very real transcendental realm characterized by very real archetypal forces which gave shape to the world and to human beings. The Roman understanding of the world was fundamentally mythical in character, and as we saw in John Gebser's analysis of mythical consciousness, this means that the Roman metaphysical framework was characterized by polarities rather than dualities. Transcendence and immanence were seen as two sides of the same coin, like yin and yang. Yet Nietzsche had inherited from Christianity and then inverted a dualistic conception of the relationship between transcendence and immanence in which a master-slave dialectic was unfolding between the two valences of that divide. Within Nietzsche's thought, therefore, there was no possibility of a real transcendental realm of objective ideals which Nietzsche could anchor himself upon. Nietzsche thus saw that in order to accord with his understanding of reality, one would be required to create and live a novel system of values which were to be created explicitly through the will to power of the individual. One who could actually manage to create such values and live them out so as to affirm life would be an individual who would supersede all preceding human history. Such an individual would be the Ubermensch, the Overman. And yet, if this overman was to be anchored and guided by absolutely nothing other than his own will to power, and if this will to power was to be understood in terms of values which were to be created and projected from the individual himself in the service of his own will to power, then we find within such a philosophy a terminally vicious self-reference. If all is power and power can be whatever I decide to regard as valuable, and if truth itself is defined in relation to such power, then reality can indeed be whatever I want it to be. There is here no longer any solid foundation to be found beyond the individual ego and its whims. There is no objective measure of power beyond what the ego chooses to regard as valuable. The individual can do whatever it wants and create values which accord with whatever life the individual actually lives. The ubermensch needn't aspire to any heroic fantasies of Caesar or Achilles, as the ubermensch can essentially just declare himself to be the ubermensch by affirming his actual life, and there is nothing more to be said. Thus we see near the end of his life that Nietzsche really did take this philosophical position seriously enough that it seems to have quite literally driven him to madness. It is speculated sometimes that Nietzsche's madness was the result of a syphilis infection, but there was never any real evidence that this was actually true. Syphilis is a disease which produces clearly visible physical effects, and none of the doctors who visited Nietzsche following his nervous breakdown saw any such indications of an infection. 
Looking to the letters which Nietzsche wrote near the end of his life, I think what we see is rather a psyche which had come to be completely fragmented and untethered from reality by the very philosophy which it had produced. Nietzsche's rejection of the Western philosophical tradition was something which he had always framed as a rejection of the ways in which the mind is able to subvert and sabotage our bodily existence. And in a bitter irony, it seems that this fate is precisely what came to destroy him. Nietzsche's life and philosophy were an attempt to resolve the conflicts between soul and body, power and love, doctrine and freedom which had come to develop during the age of institutional Christianity. Yet this resolution was accomplished by a disavowal of the transcendental dimension of reality which was ultimately untenable, both philosophically and psychologically. On the other hand, Nietzsche's life was an enactment of a will to individual liberation which was thoroughly Christian in character, even if Nietzsche himself might not have recognized it as such. It was indeed the Christian spirit within Nietzsche which presumed the possibility that an ordinary human being could achieve a kind of spiritual liberation independently of his nationality, social standing, or adherence to established dogmas. And it was also this Christian spirit within Nietzsche which sought an unequivocal affirmation of embodied human life within the natural world. Yet Nietzsche's will to freedom was impaired by dualities which Nietzsche himself was unable to mend. Through rejecting the transcendental, the imminent realm became arbitrary, vacuous, and meaningless. We come to be untethered from our sun, as Nietzsche states, with the sun here appropriately signifying the telos of the transcendental realm, the higher values which illuminated the world and which Nietzsche had come to lose contact with in his pursuit of ultimate liberation. Yet Nietzsche's life and philosophy constitute a microcosmic enactment of processes which were coming to reshape the entirety of Western civilization. The inversions of polarity which play out through the master-slave dialectic result in a phenomena which Carl Jung termed enantiodromia a process by which currents of ideological and psychical development come to transform into their polar opposites. Over the course of the past few centuries, we have seen this process take place repeatedly. With Marxism and other forms of social progressivist philosophy, for example, we see the Christian impulse towards all-encompassing justice manifest in an essentially materialistic manner. Christianity brought with it a sense of justice rooted in notions of universal human dignity and a disdain for exploitative power relations. All leftist moral intuitions are fundamentally Christian intuitions, which simply would not have been imaginable prior to the advent of Christianity. Yet these Christian moral intuitions are rooted in the metaphysical conception of all human life as holding ultimate value in relation to God and the universal possibility of human theosis. Within Marxist and social progressivist ideologies, we see these intuitions stripped of their spiritual and metaphysical underpinnings. Without a conception of universal human dignity and value which can be understood in metaphysical terms, such a sense of justice can then only be made sense of in material terms. The goal of such ideologies then becomes the achievement of a form of material equality in which all human beings possess equal power and wealth, as such ideology cannot conceptualize human equality in any other way. Leftist ideologues therefore often come to develop a sense of resentment towards not only material wealth, 
but also towards any forms of competence which might indicate a disequilibrium of material value between human beings. Any form of success becomes viewed as a privilege, and hierarchies of expertise or leadership ability come to be seen as forms of injustice, as leftist ideology can only think in terms of such material value. Likewise, the Christian ritual of confession mutates so as to become the leftist practice of performative guilt, in which the practitioner publicly enacts a kind of self-flagellation so as to atone for his perceived power over others. Yet, of course, when leftist revolutions actually do occur, their ideology always transforms so as to reveal its true underlying force. As we saw in my previous video on Goya's Saturn devouring his son, the French Revolution came to mutate into an explicit reenactment of the Roman Empire. Leftist revolutions always result in the recreation of the Roman bureaucratic power hierarchy, and we see this mode of transformation encapsulated most explicitly within the events of the French Revolution and subsequent Napoleonic Empire. We see such mutations of Christian ideology in capitalist apologetics as well. Financial prosperity often comes to serve as a materialistic placeholder for the Christian conception of grace, and therefore money comes to effectively serve as a substitute for the notion of the will of God. Once again, we see here the Christian impulses mutate into a recreation of Roman power due to those impulses coming to be untethered from their own metaphysical core. Just as Nietzsche's philosophy mutated into an inverted form of Platonism due to his becoming untethered from higher metaphysical ideals, we see this exact same enantiodromia take place within Western political ideologies which have become untethered from their core ideals through the influences of materialism. Within transhumanist ideology, we see the Christian concepts of eternal life and self-liberation come to be reformulated in a materialistic manner as well. Transhumanists dream of technological immortality and of using technology as a means to achieve a kind of liberation in which the human will to power is no longer hindered by the physiological limitations of the biological body. Although the transhumanist movement is still in its infancy, I think at this point we can see very clearly in advance where such an ideology is headed. Without any metaphysical conception of human liberation to anchor itself to, transhumanist liberation can only possibly manifest in a manner which is fundamentally hedonic. Transhumanist liberation will strive to free the power fantasies of the human ego from their physical restraints, and in doing so will open the gates for the realization of our most perverse, twisted, and morbid impulses. Every step of the way, we see the same underlying dynamics. A central polarity comes to be severed so as to create a self-contradiction between two interdependent valences of a duality. This conflict then sets in motion the Hegelian master-slave dialectic through which the two valences battle for dominance and come to invert their polarities. Through this process, ideological impulses come to be untethered from the metaphysical ideals which drive them, and those ideological impulses thus undergo enantiodromia, mutating into their exact opposites. Within our popular culture, we see this dynamic manifest symbolically within the trope of undeath. A zombie is a human being who is no longer animated by his or her own personality. The person is, in a sense, no longer there. As the zombie's body has come to be untethered from the animating solar principle, or telos, which serves as the core of the human psyche. 
A zombie is a human body which essentially lacks a soul, and which therefore comes to be animated instead by primal, feral impulses of violence and hunger. The primal will to life of the zombie is no longer guided by the higher purpose of the solar principle. The will to being, a symbiotic co-participant in a world of other such beings. As such, the zombie instead comes to see all other forms of life as either threats or food, very much like cancer cells within a living body which are no longer directed by the higher purpose of maintaining the body as a whole. Our popular imagination is obsessed with zombies because we see ourselves in zombies. More specifically, we see a very real spiritual dynamic which lies just beneath the surface of modern civilization, which will, when given the chance, come to manifest as an utterly blind and ravenous will to destroy, conquer, and consume. The human psyche is unique among other animals in that we are capable of freely aligning our own individual personalities with the higher purposes which animate the universe. Bears, wasps, and sunflowers do not freely choose to serve the cosmic logos, they just do so automatically in accordance with the underlying dynamics of nature. What this entails, however, is that we can also come to be deeply misaligned with such higher purposes, and can thus come to be animated instead by destructive forces which rob us of our own agency and annihilate the world around us. The zombie, therefore, exemplifies what the human form becomes through undergoing the process of enantiodromic inversion. We can thus see Marxism, capitalism, and social progressivism as all being, each in their own way, enantiodromic inversions of the Christian cultural forces which preconditioned them, as deformed, undead permutations of the Christian spirit. The entire historical journey of the past 2,000 years can be understood as resulting from forces set in motion due to the as yet unfulfilled promises of Christianity. This is a story which continues to unfold, but one which has only one possible ending. One which is perfectly encapsulated within the symbolic structure of the image of Christ's crucifixion the reconciliation of the polarities of transcendence and imminence, love and power, duty and freedom, body and soul, life and death, truth and dogma. Within the innermost depths of our being, we still yet find ourselves re-enacting the journey of our ancestors in pursuit of the sun's westward path unto the distant horizon. We are chasing our own souls to wherever they might lead us, and in doing so we are striving towards the realization of forms of human freedom which remain now only echoes of unborn futures. The force which will condition such futures can only possibly be Christianity. In reality, there simply is no alternative to that. Nonetheless, the Christianity which will come to condition the coming world may be something drastically different than what we would today even recognize as Christianity. The forces which are at work in shaping our destiny are utterly titanic in proportion, and what our future holds may very well be far beyond what we are now even capable of imagining. But in attempting to imagine such a future, we must return to the figure with whom this channel began. We must return to Jean Gebser and attempt to understand what Gebser saw as the emergence of an 
integral structure of human consciousness and the possibility of human freedom, which has been prefigured by every step of the journey which has brought us to our present age. The modern world is a wasteland, which we have become utterly lost and disoriented within. And yet this occurrence is no accident. The only possible conclusion of the Roman Empire was the advent of Christianity, and the possibility of theosis revealed by the life of Christ is one which demands a freedom which humanity has never before come to realize. There was never any other option other than this. Our historical destiny demanded of us that we become wanderers, lost in the desert. In the desert we find ourselves, for in the desert there is no shelter or escape from solar radiance.